Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Ideas Festival Day 3, I think. And so far, fantastic. And this morning, we're in for another really interesting session. Welcome and thank you for coming. Before I introduce our special guest, Zenith Farago, I would just like to say, just tell you a bit about this morning's presentation. It will be a 40-minute presentation, and then there will be time for questions. Before we begin, I'd really like to ask you to turn off your mobile phones for everybody's benefit. Thank you. So this morning, a quick introduction to Zenith, who's joined us this morning for a very... I've just had a quick chat to her, very insightful and thought-provoking presentation. Zenith describes herself as a funeral celebrant, a death and dying consultant and community resource. And just from speaking to her very briefly, it's very clear that she's all of those, and this will be a very insightful presentation, I think. So welcome, Zenith Farago, and we look forward to <coughs> hearing that insight. Thank you. Okay. So welcome, everyone. It's a very intimate um, morning. And I'm just going to tell you there's a very bright light there pointing at me so that the people at the back I can't see, but the rest of you I can see. So first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and honour them past, present and into the future. I'm very honoured to be the first speaker at 9.30 in the morning, especially about death and dying, because often they tuck me up at the end because it's too confronting for people. And it's, it's a great sign about um, what people do with death and dying is they... They think that they need to protect, they, whoever they are, need to protect people. Like adults protect children, families protect somebody else in their family. But really, death and dying are a very natural and sacred part of life. And the end of our lives are something that is not to be missed, I would say. So I've spent 20 years now working in this field with... Um, with, with friends, with family, with complete strangers, with expected death, with sudden death, and every sort of, pretty much every sort of death you could think of. And it, that 20 years, when I started I was 36, now I'm 54, and I've just got lighter and lighter in that experience. And as part of that, I would really encourage you, if you have the opportunity to become familiar with death, to do that, to not try and hold it at arm's length, to, to not go there fully, because the gifts in that experience, they're, they're present in the moment, and they're also present in their unfolding in the, in the time to come, especially for young people, older people, you know, we're already travelling that journey. It, it's happening. But for young people, I, uh, my best friend died when I was 14 and it took me two years to understand or get a handle on that. But I realised when I was about 40 that I'd actually spent most of my life very impacted by that death because it made me live every moment as fully as I could because he died quite suddenly as an accident and... I just thought, wow, you never know what tomorrow's going to bring. You could be dead tomorrow. And saying to people, do it now, you could be dead tomorrow, is one of my favourite sayings. And people are just used to it now where we live. So I live in Byron Bay, which is, I've lived there for nearly 30 years. And Byron Bay has a great lifestyle. So when we started to die, we wanted a death style. We didn't want to get caught back up in the system that most of us had decided that we didn't really want to be part of. We wanted to create something for ourselves that worked for us. And there were a lot of people there who are what I would call sort of pseudo-Buddhists. They, they wouldn't identify as Buddhists, but they've travelled in the East, they've read, they've got a hippie approach to life. They're the, you know, the original environmentalists. And so they're bringing a sustainability to that experience. And, and with that, they, they didn't want to return to the church. They didn't want to return to uh, just give it the body over. They wanted to create something that worked for them. So what we started to do was a range of things where I had a background in law 
And when I was about 36, my best friend died in the garden suddenly. And I went with her husband to view her body because I was so surprised. She was a healthy woman. She'd had an aneurysm and she died. And as we walked out of the morgue, I said to him, you know, we could do this ourselves. We don't need to hand her over to someone else. And would you like me to do that? He said, yes, that would be great. And there I was. And I set off on that journey to discover how to create a funeral, deal with the body, build a coffin, drive it in our own car, all those sorts of things. And I was very fortunate. As I was driving home that day, I saw a funeral directors that I'd never seen before. And I went in and I said, hi, my name's Zenith. My best friend's just died. And can you tell me what I need to know? And he did. He told me everything I needed to know, gave me all the paperwork, and we did the whole thing ourselves. We picked her up from the coroner. We washed and dressed her body. We built the coffin. We drove it in our own car. I did the funeral. And we put her in the cremator ourselves because at that point it was pre-computerized things and you could actually push the coffin into the cremator. And there's something about doing when you're, when you're fully done that gets you there. And that's not possible anymore. Now you just press a button and it goes clunk, 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 and it disappears. But you can go around the back of the crematorium and see the body go into the cremator rather than that chintzy when the curtains close and what happens then. So there's a lot of things you can do in that process that the funeral industry should assist you to do. They're a service industry. They're there to give you a service. So often when I'm speaking to groups of people, I'm encouraging them like a travel agent. I say, you know, get a girlfriend, get a partner, go to write some questions out, Go to the funeral in industry, Go into it, walk into a funeral parlour and ask them what sort of service they offer you. Don't be afraid. And, and they should then offer you... And you can say whether you like it or not. And you can say, well, would you, would you do this if we wanted that? And you'll get a feel for them rather than just like this when that experience occurs. It's a very... It can be a very empowering or a very disempowering experience. So it's up to you. You are the, the, the client. You are the bereaved. You are the dying person. You, know, you are the consumer. And they're a consumer profit industry. So I'm just going to leave you with that for now as a sort of taste. And now I'm going to show you my fabulous slideshow. Because I'd like you to read this. This is Lunig, who's a master. And you can get a feel from where I'm coming from. And it goes across. Hold on, across. Everyone should have one of these on their fridge. It, it changes a lot of people's um, kind of things. Because it's absolutely my experience that most people believe that something leaves the body when you die. So religious people believe that, spiritual people believe that, even scientists believe it because they understand quantum physics. And a few people believe that the body is organic and when it dies, Everything dies and that's it. And I, I've also done funerals for people like that. But, you know, they're, and they're, that's a beautiful belief to have. It makes it very simple for them. But really the biggest thing around death and dying is fear. Most people are in some sort of fear of it. So part of my work is to try and dissolve that fear. And the more familiar you become with it, a bit like anything, a bit like swimming deep in the ocean, which I also do a lot, is you dissolve the fear of sharks. 
which is a very Australian thing. But I didn't grow up with that, so I don't have that fear. But I am a deep swimmer. And recently I had an experience where I could see totally that over 20 years I've dissolved that fear. It does, if the shark is coming, that's a different story. But the fear of it coming, and I, you know, everything's a practice. But somebody, I was swimming deep, somebody came along and said, well, you should be careful out here, I've just seen a couple of sharks. And I said, and what am I supposed to do about that? You know, I was, I was a goodly K from the beach. And um, so I just had to swim, continue to do the swim. And I could see that nothing in my body changed, apart from I found it amusing, because I dissolved the fear. And so starting to dissolve fear about dying is something you can start at any time. Because it may be your death or it may be the death of someone close to you that you're looking at. So really, um, you know, I don't see death as a taboo at all, obviously. I see it as our birthright and it's part of a full life. So recently I just did a ceremony for a young 25-year-old woman who died in a fire in Paris. But her family live in Byron. And, you know, that is a full life. It's not a life cut short because we're projecting onto that something that isn't. It's a full life. And if you can start to shift those uh, approaches and those concepts, it allows you to move into a healthier bereavement and a place of acceptance. It doesn't mean you're not sad or it's hurting or it's painful, but there's something that doesn't eat you away because you can't change the circumstances of what's happened. You can only be with how you feel. And generally, I'm looking at a spectrum. So most people, it used to be bereavement care. Then it went to grief and bereavement, and now it's gone to grief. So what, what medicine, what psychology is doing is, is, is instilling in people that grief is the natural default position. For, for dealing with death. But it sort of isn't. It, sadness is the natural default position. So if you see it on a spectrum and you see sadness as the middle point, over here is, is deep grief. And between sadness and deep grief is grief. And a lot of people will be in that place. But between sadness and this point, this point is joy and liberation. And some people will go there when somebody dies because they're happy for them that they've died. Their suffering is over or they've been cruel to them during their life and they're happy. <laughs> Which, you know, it's a rich life. So, but between them is, and sometimes between sadness and joy is relief, which is a, can you see that spectrum? So most people will default to sadness and really what that is, is that is love transformed due to the circumstances into another emotion. It's, it becomes sadness or grief. And eventually, it may take years, but eventually that grief will transform itself back to, to sadness or to joy. Can you, can you get there with that? Yeah. Great. So I'd just like to read you this little clip from Soggy Wimpache, which says, When we finally know we are dying and all other sentient beings are dying with us, we start to have a burning, almost heartbreaking sense of the fragility and preciousness of each moment and each being. And from this can grow a deep, clear, limitless compassion for all beings. So what he's seeing is that death is natural and that it's sacred. And I would really encourage you to own age as a part of that experience because we're a culture. I'm Really what I'm moving for is cultural change, regardless of religion, regardless of anything else, that we need to embrace that death is coming to everyone. It's not something that you can deny, but... Some people will embrace it and some people will just get on with it. But the more you start to contemplate it, 
the more you practice for that experience, the more you help yourself and other people that you love. So how I see it is that if somebody is embracing that journey, it's like they're like this. They've got their arms outstretched, and in here are their family and friends. And as they walk towards death, they're walking just like I am towards that really bright light. <laughs> and they're taking everyone with them. And they're smiling and they're talking and they're communicating and they're crying together. But when they die, they drop away. But the people keep walking together. The family, the community, the friends, they keep walking. They don't drop to their knees. And for a little while afterwards, I, or during that process, I'm walking behind everyone like this. But then after the funeral, I drop away. And then they walk on, and they walk back into their community. And they say, oh, my mum's just died. And people say, oh, how was that? And they say, it was amazing. You know, it was such a beautiful experience. It's, you know, and variations on that theme, not like, Oh, God, it was terrible. I don't know how I'm going to survive. And, you know, many of you have, you know, no doubt you will have lost family or friends close to you. Some of you may have even lost children, which is, you know, a very big loss. And a friend of mine lost her son, and she was in a, a deep grief for a goodly three years. And she was in a grief for six years. And then suddenly she sort of popped out of it. So I am absolutely familiar with grief, and I don't deny it happens, but I just think that culturally, and you see it in other cultures where they're sort of sad or they're joyful, but we've got this thing about it. So if we own age, we're owning the prelude, the natural prelude to death. So... For me, I see that death is an internal and external journey. So it's what happens on the outside, the trimmings, what you want, what the death plan you make. But also, it's mostly it's an internal journey. Some people might say that's a spiritual journey. But really, it, it's a contemplative journey. And so my daily practice now is to be present to every moment. So if I die, I don't miss it. So that if something is hurtling towards me, if the shark is coming, I am present for that moment. And that enriches my life no end. It doesn't mean I'm inviting it. it if it's coming, it's coming. And I see the randomness of it, but I also see, and I've probably seen this for 15 years, that even if people die suddenly in an accident that is not of their making, somebody hurtles towards them, the signs are very clear that in that four-week, six-week period before they die, before they are impacted by the accident, there will be clear indication that something is changing for them, that they, they're different in some way. And often people are at their happiest just before they die, and if they die suddenly. So has anybody had that experience? Has anybody? They, they, they've seen a friend and something changes in them and then bang, they're gone. And in the sadness of it, you can lose sight of that. But when, when, if you sit at the funeral and people are allowed to speak, you'll often hear people say, you know, something had changed for them and in the last few weeks this, or they came and told me this and they said goodbye last time I saw them and it was, it was a very different feeling. So... These are all things to be present to. Because, And if you get that inkling, to pay attention to it. And just, it doesn't mean you're going to die. It just means you're going to be more present. But some people will die because it happens to all of us. And part of my thing is to always say yes to whatever is presenting itself. And that's why I'm here because they rang and asked me to do this. But also, if I hadn't said yes to that first experience, the face of death on the North Coast will be very different. So what I'm going to continue to show you here is this little slideshow. So it has some images, and one of those images, just so you can get a bigger view, and one of those images of, is of Jenny, a, a woman who I was 
being with when she was dying. And there's some photos of her alive and then there's a very gentle photo of her after she died. And I'm just saying that in case people get a shock. It, it's so not shocking, but I want to give you that awareness. And I'll speak, I'll talk you through it. So just go with it. I'm assuming that most of you have said yes to all those questions. Is that right? Okay, that's all. So this is the spectrum that I'm working on. Wellness, illness, dying, death, the in-between, which is post-death and pre-ceremony. The ceremony, the disposal, and the bereavement. And a lot of people find the word disposal somewhat disturbing. But, but when you look, when you understand the process, and because some people don't have a ceremony, some people start at death, some people, you know, have a bereavement. But you have to dispose of the body in some way. And usually by the end of the ceremony, you're ready to dispose of the body because you see it is just a physical body. It is not that person. Whatever was in that person, whatever the life force was, the spirit, the soul, whatever label you want to put in it, has clearly gone. And even children will come to a coffin that's an open coffin or they'll go to have a vigil where the body's at home. And if you listen to the children, they will say, oh, but that's not granny. She's not there. They, they see it really clearly. And as, as, have people had that experience themselves when you've, yeah. So if, it, and it's that place that, you know, is assisting to you. So viewing the body and, and really going with that allows you to see something that is very obvious. So this was Jenny. And this is the morning of her death. She died at home. Her sons had been caring for her. And these are two friends of mine, musicians, Miten and Pramal. And um, they offered to come and sing for her because she, they were favourites of hers. And so they did. So we had this little concert and the boys had made the house really beautiful. And this is later in the afternoon with her son Andrew and the dog. So... This all looks very normal, doesn't it? Isn't that a nice way to go? And then this is even later in the afternoon with her other son and his partner. And they just spent the afternoon together, gently. And then that I'd written a, a death meditation for her, which one of the sons read to her, which was really about gratitude, about gratitude for life, gratitude for a range of things. And also gratitude to your body. But my experience is that what most people are doing is they're losing connection or desire for worldly events, for community events, for possessions, for their home even, for their family. Children are usually last, but there comes a time even then when people, if they've done the rest of the process as well as they can, they can let go of their children. And then they're just, the only thing they have to let go of is the body and to leave that body. And that is the conversation I have with lots of people because that's where they are and that's what they're experiencing. They, they don't want to be in that body anymore. It's dying. It's, it's past its use by day. They are ready to leave. And and so I didn't have, all, this is not how I thought 20 years ago when I started. I did not think about things like this. But this is the benefit of sharing all those journeys with all those people. And then Jenny died 
in the evening and the boys made a beautiful space for her and just left her there. One of them slept on the couch next to her. And then the next morning I came and she'd written three letters for her sons and I put them there. And then they'd got a coffin, a plain pine coffin with rope handles and they, they drove it in their own car. I did all the paperwork for them. And this is another funeral where this is a plain Kabul coffin. This is a community at Bodhi Farm. And this is Peter, who was an you know, elderly environmentalist. And this is on his way to the grave. They've had a ceremony in the park, um, in the house, the, the community house. Can we take him down? This is another one. Tim, this is at the at the cemetery and this is a plain old Kabul coffin with no lining. So coffins are generally lined with plastic and then fabric. So we all know what happens to anything that is deteriorating and it is kept in plastic. So you don't need to have a plastic lining. You need to have an absorbent lining. And this is a, um, a photographic on a on a coffin. Here's a bamboo that in Europe are very common. I buried my mum in one of them. And that's the inside. So no lining. My mum was afraid of the dark, so I put her in bamboo because it let the light in, even though she was dead and everything I know doesn't make any difference. But it made me feel better and it brought me comfort, which is really what my job is, is to try and bring comfort at that time with information, to empower people to participate more fully, to discuss it. This is a, a woven out of rope. So one ball of rope, well, several balls of rope actually, but that was a weaver and she made that for a young boy, a girl. And this is Hubert's coffin and that's open. There's no lid on that and Hubert is in there. And that little boy, sat, this is the funeral. And that little boy, who is his godson, sat in that tree for the whole funeral. And on the side of the coffin, which you can't read where those handles are, there's a slash and it says, life is precious, handle with prayer. And he'd made that. We did a coffin making workshop. And that sat on his deck. You can see how weathered it is. It had had his work boots in there, the kids' wellies, everything. And then... He died. He wasn't sick at all when he made it. He's just very enthusiastic. And, um, and this is Sasha and Sky. They're bringing their mum, Felicity, to a funeral. And this is the funeral. So it's an open coffin. It's open air. It's at the Surf Club in a public place in Byron Bay. Fortunately, it was a perfect day. So can you see how different that experience is? And if whatever emotions are coming, they dissipate because you're outside, you're not held. Some circumstances, it's great to be inside and be held cosy because sometimes it's very shocking and you feel the need to do that. But a lot of people choose to have funerals that are outside because they feel nature supports them at that time. And then we went to the grave and they released doves, which allows you to finish up and open-hearted. And it's very hard to be sad when you're in that position. I invite you to try that at some stage. So this is a natural burial ground, which in Europe very common, we're, we're moving towards them here. So you're not all in a row. And this is a natural burial ground and they're visiting their husbands and they meet once a month. They didn't know each other before they buried their husbands there together. They bring a picnic and they sit and chat, but they also comfort newly bereaved people. You know, sometimes, especially it's parents of small children and they there at that cemetery they bury everybody together, so they don't have a separate section just for the children. And then once a year I do a ceremony in the park in, in Mullumbimby around this tree 
where we have an hour for community art and people make a range of things and they come and bring things. It doesn't matter whether that person's died this year or 30 years ago. And that is about cultural change. It, regardless of religion, regardless of culture, everybody's there together. And this is a great way for children to learn about dying and death. And what happens is now when kids experience somebody during that year, they say, oh, that's great, we can light a candle for them, put a photo on the tree. So they bring a sense of lightness to it that actually supports the parents sometimes. And people just sit in the park and there's a tree. It's very simple, but it's a beautiful day. And these four little boys, we all know how difficult it is to control small boys. <laughs> and I'm there raving on like this, and they're at the tree behind me. And they, and I know three of those kids, and they're not, um, they're, they're general boys. Anyway, they went round and relit all the tea lights while that ceremony was happening with boxes of matches, which was great. They got to play with fire. <laughs> but... You know, they have this beautiful thing, and here they just read. This is two um, uh, things that people have put up, and they're just sort of, this is a random shot. But it just really captures the day, I think, and how, how unfrightened children are. And um, these are from the Blues Festival. They had them, which pearly gates, and I said, can I borrow them? They'll be great. So we made that the entrance <coughs> to the park. And... Um, and, th and also the skeletons, which are very much that um, New Orleans jazzy East Coast thing that the Blues Festival is. And we put them in the tree. And um, it, again, it just brought a sense of something to it for everybody. And then um, connecting everybody together because we all share the same connection. And then... Everybody came together and you can see just where everybody's been sitting on their picnic rugs and everything. And then we just did a big whoosh to end the ceremony because everybody gets the celebration generally. A lot of people feel that when they go to a funeral, they don't want it to be sad. They want to go, they want it to be a celebration of somebody's life, which it is. But you can't just go to celebration. You have to go to sadness and then come to celebration. You have to honour th that loss. So what I want to do is, um, is give you some things, ideas, sustainable ideas. So these are external ideas. So you might want to write letters to loved ones. You might want to create a recorded message. You might want to have a living wake. You might want to die at home, build your own coffin, use a cardboard coffin, use a shroud, which is perfectly legal. You just have to get permission from the health department. You might want to drive them in your own car. You might want to bury on private ground. Each council has a policy for that. You might want to bury in a natural burial ground. You might want to plant a tree on the ashes. You might want to have a fantastic funeral. They're all sustainable things. And then about sustainability and happiness. Well, happiness is a sort of internal thing. And some external things make you happy. But really, as we all should all know, it's about what's happening on the inside. You, can, you really want to be generating happiness from the inside not because something influences you from the outside. So you might want to talk to people. Um, you might want to dialogue with them, the people that share your life and share also about death, what you would like. So if you do that in advance, so if I'm driving along and I say, oh, God, I love this song. I really love it at the funeral. But then uh, people say, oh, that's great. But if I'm driving along and I've got breast cancer and I'm, on my way to chemo and I say, I really like this song at my funeral. It's a different story. It's, a, it's slightly harder to hear. Or people are unfamiliar with how they should respond. But if you are the person there, then you're the best person to be there. So don't be afraid. 
dissolve the fear of saying, oh, and what else would you like at the funeral? Or, you know, broach that subject. And when people ring and invite me to come and share their dying, the most common place they start is we've picked the music for the funeral. So it doesn't matter that they're at the beginning of that spectrum. That's a re we all know how good it feels to have music at a funeral, and so that's a really easy place to start. So you might want to make proper preparations. You might want to travel that journey accompanied honestly by family and friends, especially if you're leaving children. You might want to slow things down. You might want to pick up the phone or not pick up the phone. So when somebody, if you find somebody that's died, so if it's your partner, if it's your parent, you come downstairs and they've died in the chair overnight. They didn't go up after watching TV. And they're clearly dead. You do not need to pick up the phone immediately. So the option is you pick up the phone, you ring the ambulance, you ring the police, everything goes into action and it is unstoppable. It's a legal process and you cannot stop it. You can't say, well, can you just come back? I want to sit with them for a couple of hours. But if you do not pick up the phone, if you go and pick up the kettle and make a cup of tea, which you can make on remote, it doesn't matter if you drink it, or you can just sit down in the chair, then you will have half an hour, you can have two hours, you can have as long as you want. If they are clearly dead and they cannot be resuscitated, then just sit with them. Can you see the difference of what, of just that one piece of information? And often people are very sad when somebody dies alone. There's a common statement that people say, oh, nobody should have to die alone in this day and age. But if you try and think that death is an internal experience, like I'll be very happy to die alone because I will be concentrating. I don't want to miss that moment because it's my awareness that my body will be flooded with endorphins, which is a um, scientific fact. So I will be in a state of euphoria and I will be coming something else, just like birthing. And I don't want to miss that. So don't pick up the phone until you're ready. And the other thing is, some recently um, a friend, his mother was in dying in the States. She'd gone into a coma and he knew that she would die while he was in transit. So I said to her, well, get somebody to put the phone next to her ear. So even if she can't hear you, even if you know she doesn't respond, you feel better because you've said to her what you wanted to say while you're alive because it's about comfort. And he did that, and while he was in transit to the States, she died. But he felt much better. And the other thing is that um, when you, a lot of people want to visit and sit with the body. You can bring it home overnight. You can have a vigil. But if that body is in a coffin, you, you can't access it. And what you'll see from where you are is, um, is the side of the coffin. But some people want to see that body not in a coffin so that you can go and, you know, you can sit there and you can hold hands, but you can't sit down when a coffin, a body's in a coffin. Whereas you can just sit, which makes it easier for you, the bereaved, and easy access to the body. So you can ask for that. They, they don't need to put the body, and they don't generally do it until the last minute for the funeral, but they'll do it if you're coming for a viewing, if you don't ask, that you're happy to see that body on a tray. Can you see the difference that that makes at that time? Um, okay, so we're going to open for questions. And I'm just going to read you this last bit, which is my favourite piece about death, which is called The Contemplation of No Coming and No Going. And because there's nothing to see, I invite you to close your eyes and just listen and sort of feel it. This body is not me. I am not limited by this body. I am life without boundaries. I have never been born and I have never died. Look at the oceans and the sky filled with stars, manifestations from my wondrous true mind. Since before time, I have been free. Birth and death are only doors through which we pass, sacred thresholds on our journey. Birth and death are a game of hide and seek. 
So laugh with me. Hold my hand. Let us say goodbye. Say goodbye to meet again soon. We meet today. We will meet again tomorrow. We will meet at the source of every moment. And we meet each other in all forms of life. And there's a beautiful wall hanging that I keep seeing wherever I go. And it says, in the end, what matters most is how you lived, how you loved, and how well you learnt to let go. And I, I just really think that is, that's a great contemplation. Thank you. Thank you, Zenith. Thank you for speaking with such fondness and openness and optimism about death and dying. Thank you. We are going to have about 20 minutes now for questions, but I will ask, we do have some roving microphones around. If you would just wait, if you just put up your hand and wait until the microphone gets to you before you ask your question. Thank you. Nothing. <laughs> Working? Is it Neil? This is Neil. Yeah. Oh, uh, hi. Hi, <laughs> uh, right, so I'd like to say that um, Zenith was um, the celebrant at the funeral of a very good friend of mine quite a few years ago at Byron Bay, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, but uh, my question is actually about something a bit more immediate. Um, my lover's second husband just died, and I'm kind of in that space of feeling kind of glad about it, and I'm not really feeling that good about that. And... Um, you know, he was he was kind of a difficult person, and um, also, you know, sort of stopped me from having co significant contact with my mother even during the time that she was dying. And um, I'm kind of finding it a bit hard to handle this 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 feeling of you know, kind of somewhere between an indifference and kind of you know at last he's gone kind of feeling, and it's kind of um, freaking me out a bit. Well, what, what I would say to that, I don't really know the answer because I'm not a psychologist, but what I would encourage you to do is just, you've got, you've got a duality happening because you, you're probably glad that he's gone because it frees you up for your mum, but she's going to be sad if she loved him, or she might be happy that he's also gone. Well, she's already, she, already, she died about three years ago. Oh, okay. Right, well then that's a different story. So, I don't know, you just have to be with what you're feeling, but... If you're feeling that, don't feel bad about it. Just feel it fully and it will probably dissolve itself out. Because if, you, then you'll have two things happening. You're, you're in conflict with yourself. It's a bit like smoking a cigarette. I say to people, if you're going to smoke, just enjoy it. Don't say, oh, this is so bad for me. Because then you're doing a double negative. But you're not... You're only going to do a negative if you feel bad about it. If that's the feelings you have, then it, just be with that. You don't, a lot of people are joyful when somebody dies. That's why I'm trying to give people that spectrum because there's a, re there's a relief, but often there's a joy. And I, I think in, if the circumstances warrant that, that's fine. But, but that may or may not help I had you. a dream, though, the other night that I was kind of in this lift with two elderly people and we got stuck. And then the list started again. We went up to the roof, and I kind of thought, well, maybe that's them. And then, in a way, by letting go of this feeling towards um, Alan, that I somehow, somehow felt liberating my mother as well. If you feel it fully, it will eventually dissolve. If you try and hold something at arm's length, it will. Cont if you resist something, you give it more energy, and it will eventually bite you in the bum. So my experience is to just feel it fully, even if it's something that you feel bad about, <laughs> to just feel it all. And then it just generally dissolves itself away. It, it doesn't maintain that ferocity. It, it will transform. Everything transforms into something else. I don't know if that's helpful. But, but oh, come on. <laughs> You spoke about um, there being legal matters that have to be 
um, processed or adhered to after a death. Okay. Um, is it possible to keep um, the body with you um, and go through the whole process of um, a natural funeral without releasing the body to the morgue or um, and yes, um, the answer is yes. yes. Yeah, and we do that often. So that what you've got is two types of death. You've got sudden and expected. So if it's expected and somebody's dying in hospital or dying at home, you can if they're dying at hospital, you can go and collect the body yourself. And you can, you can if they're dying at home, you can keep the body at home for five days. That's set in the health department regulations in the health mm -hmm. acts. I can't think of the name at the moment, but anyway, it says very clearly you can you can keep the body at home for no longer than five days, which means you can keep it for five days. Mm -hmm. But if it's sudden, then they, they have to discover the cause of death. So that will be an autopsy. So my friend Sylvia had an autopsy, but when that was finished, I went to the coroner, I collected her body in our car, we drove her home, we washed and dressed her body ourselves. She'd had an autopsy, which is a cut from here to here to here. And if, if you, they will, if you, I ring and say, we're going to have an open coffin, we, the family going to wash and dress that body, can you do a nice job? And what they do then is when they, stitch that body back up they do it nicely and instead of just a haphazard thing if nobody's going to look some people work very well and others it can be a little bit shoddy and so from there on the funeral director would normally take that they would keep the body in the fridge they would do the paperwork they would put it in a car and they would drive it to the funeral and then it would go to the last part of its journey but if you want to do it, you can do all that, but you have to keep the body cold. Mm -hmm. And I I that depends on the circumstances of the death. So five days is a really long time to keep a body. We've, and usually if it's expected, people are ready for the funeral. Everybody's on standby, so they can clunk into action. But if it's a sudden death, then people have to you know, fly, they have to change everything, they have to all of that. And so often people will use a funeral director to keep the body in the fridge, which is just a big cold room. It's not like you see it in America where it's got drawers. It's like a big chiller, just like you put fruit and vegetables in. And you can keep the body there, and then you can take it home and have a vigil or be with that body overnight. Or so sometimes people pick it up at 6, everybody comes, they sleep overnight, and the funeral's the next morning. Sometimes people pick it up at nine, take it home, keep it all day and all night and then take it to, to the funeral or to the disposal. Sometimes they'll have a ceremony late in the day. So if you just expand into other situations that you're trying to deal with and you're trying to accommodate everybody, then if you try and see it from a reasonably normal perspective, even though it sort of isn't, then you'll be able to think a solution through rather than just let them run you through something and then you pop out at the other end and you think, whoa. And then somebody says, you could have done this, you could have done that. So in Europe, the standard length of time between death and the disposal is 10 days. Whereas here, we've got this three-day thing. Mm. And it, it's too fast. Four, five days is a goodly amount of time. Often in sudden death, it's a whole week. People, we just slow it down. People, kids fly in. Um, you know, there's time for those people to fly in from somewhere else, spend a whole day with the body, and then get up to speed. And then we have a funeral, and everybody's in the same place. So there's no need. There's no requirement anywhere that says it has to be three days. Mm. And can you can you feel that? Can you feel the difference of just having longer? to deal with that. So just one more. Um, so after you've had your cup of tea, <laughs> um, and I would imagine the first thing you would need to do would be to find a doctor to have the 
you know, the body. If it's an expected death yeah. and the doctor has been treating that person, they can sign off mm -hmm. on a death certificate. But if it's if somebody has just died and they cannot define, you know, like a young healthy person, if you've got a history of a disease that would take your life, if you've got heart disease and you've had a heart attack, the doctor will decide whether they can sign off on it or not. But they can't always because they don't. They, it's not clear what the cause of death is and then there has to be an autopsy. Mm. If you haven't seen a doctor within three months, you have to have an autopsy or they will decide, the coroner will decide. Mm. And some families don't need to know the cause of death. For elderly people, it's not always uh, necessary and sometimes they give you the option now. But but not, you can't always just call the doctor and they'll say, oh, yeah, it looks like they've had a heart attack. They have to say they've had a heart attack. Or it could be something else completely different. Mm. And especially with cremation because the body will be gone. You can't have a second. If somebody says, oh, I think there might have been foul play, you can't revisit the body. Mm. So. Um, I wanted to ask about how you deal and, I guess, help people deal with a sudden unexpected death that is the choice of the person who's died, such as um, suicide. Because I know that that's, um, you know, with a lot of people, there's, like, yeah. lots of feelings of kind of residual guilt and responsibility yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. especially when it kind of happens to people, you know, at a young age. Yeah. So... When somebody takes their own life, I if you label it suicide, it's very potent. A lot of people have a strong reaction to that word. So I'm generally saying when somebody takes their own life. So my personal opinion and my professional opinion is that that's a choice to be honoured, unless it's children, which I've also dealt with under 16. And that's, that's a sort of difficult set of circumstances. But generally... I see it as a choice to be honoured. And that's the energy I'm coming to hold that funeral with. But I'm acknowledging all those things for all those people. I'm acknowledging they might feel, they might have felt that they, they uh, contributed towards that by saying something. They might feel guilty about that. They might feel, I could have done something different. So I'm, in the funeral, I've got them all there. And often <coughs> if it's a young person, it's a big funeral. And I'm trying to transform those feelings, a bit like with Neil, a bit like with smoking. You're trying to transform them into something else so that they don't sit there s eating themselves away with that because it won't serve any purpose. You can transform it into something useful because if you're in that situation again, you might act differently. You might not say something that was hurtful. You might not tease them and I've had it where a young boy went to school on a Friday and he said oh I'm going to kill myself I had a long history of depression I'm going to kill myself he went back to school on the Monday and he hadn't killed himself and somebody said to him whoa piker and he went home and shot himself and and so there was a lot of energy in that school around that and for that boy himself but he had a it's a bigger picture than just that one moment and you're never going to get the answers. So I don't see it often as useful to ask all those intense questions like this because you're never going to get the answers. You may be able to make some sense of it, but it's an internal journey for that person who made that decision. It's not just about what affects them on the outside. And sometimes it might be one small headline in the paper that flips somebody... They just think, oh, I can't take this anymore in the world. You know, the world's so messed up. So it might look like one set of circumstances, but it might just be one tiny straw. We never know. So I'm encouraging people to just be with what is and to, and to begin to transform that into and let them leave you a legacy of a way of being in the world. You can't change it for them but they can leave you a legacy of a way of being in the world that is more useful, more beneficial to people. And a lot of people with mental illness will take their life in a moment of clarity. 
because they don't want a, their family to suffer anymore. They're going to suffer because they're dead, but suffering is a part of life, you know, and uh, you, know, you can only make the best decisions you can. Does that help? Okay. And then there's that guy there. Is it, did you want the mic or did you want to give it to him? No, okay. Um, I was kind of curious about how you work with um, division within families because I know that a person could have strained relationships between different parts of the family and it could probably create a bit of and some people may not want to attend the same funeral That's like how do right. you work around that sort of stuff I, I, I work with it and um, I I, I s one of the questions I'm asking if I haven't got a, clo a really good feel is is and what are the relationships like in the family but generally it will reveal itself and I'm trying my job is to try and keep everybody um, comforted in some way so I've got to deal with everybody and sometimes you sit there and there's a big uh, dispute and also the other thing I see is that men and women do it very differently and that can cause uh, friction so you know, women will sit endlessly with cups of tea, eye to eye, talking about it over and over again all day. Men will sit for a while, they listen to it, and then they'll say, I'm going to mow the lawn, I'm going to do this. And I think that's a perfectly normal response for a man, for anybody really, but particularly for men. And they'll do it in their own way. And I've heard lots of stories from men where they say, I'm still in trouble with my wife because when my son died, she doesn't think I did it properly. And for women, there's a, you know, there's a need to keep going with it, to whatever. So sometimes that might cause a stress. But w if it's long ingrained, where two people aren't talking to each other, you know, then it's just going to sort of accentuate that. But it's a time to... Sometimes people will put that in the past. They'll come together. Sometimes they won't. And with that, I'm just dealing with that then with compassion but often with a pragmatism because that's all you can do and so I had it recently where a guy died and the family were organizing that and they said to me if the wife if the ex-wife comes if she speaks we're going to get up and walk out so I went to her when she arrived and I said I just have to tell you that the family have told me that if you speak they're going to get up and walk out so I appreciate that, you know, you probably have things to say. Is there, can somebody else speak on your behalf? And, so, and your daughter. And she waded out and somebody else spoke on her behalf. So that, that worked. But, um, but recently I was at a funeral and somebody, the first wife got up and the, sec the second wife had said a whole range of beautiful things. And the first wife got up and said, well, actually, all these other things. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and she wasn't vindictive. She just wanted to set the record straight. It wasn't a, an attack on him, just for the sake of it. It was they'd been um, uh, anyway. They'd worked on a project together. He'd got all the credit about indigenous studies, but she said actually he was very awkward with the people. He didn't. She was an anthropologist. He didn't. He didn't work very well. But he he'd taken that, and um, everybody has thought, wow. And she got up and set that record straight. And it was very difficult for the rest of the people there to hear that. But I saw that as an act of absolute bravery on her part, not because she didn't want to attack him. She just was being honest. And she had the right to be honest. And she was the mother of the children. And um, it was interesting. And then you just try and honour that in a way. So... It's it's you're moving like this all the time. You you know you you're reading people in the meeting and at the funeral, and often something will happen in the funeral left field, but once you begin something, it will create its own magic and its own situation. And I'm running with that, and sometimes it's tricky, <laughs> but generally we get there. And it, you know I'm just doing my best really all I can do. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks.
you, everyone. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But I'd like to thank you, Zena, for you. sharing with us something very positive and very insightful this morning. And thank you, everyone, for coming on Saturday morning to hear about death and dying and how positive it can be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>